Hello YouTube friends, in today's video I want to do a crash course on Active Pieces. If you're not familiar with Active Pieces, it is an automation tool much like Zapier, Make, Pabli, etc. But completely open source. Open source means that the source code is developed in public and this allows the community to contribute as well as drive the project. One advantage of being open source is being able to run on your, in your own server, which I'll be touching on in a little bit. This video is for the beginners who are completely new to the platform, as well as who are more familiar with how the platform works, but would like to get the most out of it. I'm not gonna waste your time on boring documentation, but instead we'll do examples so that concepts are more concrete. If you want a complete crash course on active pieces and productive right away, this video is for you. I'll be walking you through cloud versus running on your own server, I'm going to go over the active pieces UI, define the concept of triggers and actions and what that constitutes, creating a flow, including managing flows. I'll be going over conditional or control pieces to control your flows. I will also go over majority of the core pieces and demonstrate how we use each one. I'm also going to be covering how to use the code and its interface and how to debug your code. I'm also going to be covering how to use the helper pieces. And lastly, I'll be covering some additional options as well so your flow can recover from failure. So a lot of people has been requesting this video for a very long time. And I'm super excited to create this video for you guys. Without further ado, let's get started on the video. If you're new here, my name is Dennis and I'm a principal software engineer. I make videos on coding, automation and AI every week. My goal in this channel is to simplify technical things and to make things such as automation accessible for everyone. If you like videos like this, please make sure to subscribe to this channel and click on the notification bell so you get updated with my videos release. All right, so let's get into the video. All right, so let's briefly talk about the difference between running on the cloud versus a self-hosted. So if you look in the website, they give you different, different options. The highly recommended option is the top of which is the Docker or Docker Compose. The cloud edition, which is the Active Pieces cloud environment, uh, which does have some pros and cons. So I'm going over that. So if you go with the Active Pieces cloud, which is hosted on their server, it is the most convenient option, but it comes with a subscription cost and it's going to be limited based on the size of your team, of your organization and the requirement as a whole. The pros with the cloud edition is that everything is going is always going to be updated with the latest active pieces changes from their repository their active pieces team is always going to be responsible for the hardware as far as scaling it and maintenance and it will just be performant it's just going to work out of the box the cons for this one is going to be you're going to be limited by the pricing depending on the type of plan that you have so you have the team and the agency plan so the team is if you have a, a large organization you're managing a team where versus an agency which is for any agency that are managing multiple clients so just depending on the plan that you have uh, you're going to be uh, limited based on that so you have the cloud versus self-hosted so we're going to be focusing on the cloud as far as the team is concerned you can have a limited projects you have the single sign-on audit logs environment and get syncing so you can back up your flows to the repository as you need as you can transfer it move it and you always have unlimited flows, unlimited folders, unlimited flow steps, but you're limited to a monthly task with additional one a dollar per extra thousand tasks and also it's per user. So if you have multiple users, you can have to pay nine nine dollars per user for the team plan. And for the agency, you have the same thing, except you have different things such as branding, you can have custom colors and logos, custom domain. You have unlimited projects and pieces and being able to manage multiple projects since you're running an agency. The, the task is limited per project and then you can set language and all that. Same thing with unlimited flows, unlimited uh, folders. And it's a little bit cheaper per user since you're running an agency. Same thing with monthly task of by default, it's a thousand monthly task and it's going to be $35 per user. It's going to be priced a dollar per extra thousand task. So that's going to be if you're running it on the active pieces cloud, which is the main option that most people are familiar with. Everything's going to be ran by the active pieces team. So if you're running it you know, on a, a self-hosted by default for one project, one user in a pro version, it's going to be free with unlimited tasks. You have more control over your environment and you own your own data. So if you have a specific requirements where your data has to reside in a specific server or within a specific region, the self-hosted is for you. It's unlimited. As you can see, you need to pay for per user. So if you have multiple users that you need to add at your account, it's $10 extra user per month. But by default, it's going to be free. 
So it is unlimited, but you have to make sure you have enough resources such as the CPU and memory. In my experience, four gigs and two CPU is the sweet spot as far as the resource concern and being able to ha handle the minimum amount of workload. The cost is relative to how many tasks that you have. It's really, the more tasks you have, obviously you're gonna need more CPU and memory. By default, if you're running it on your own cloud, the recommended approach is either the Docker, which is the fastest. I really don't recommend this option, but this is the quickest way of getting started. Docker Compose is the better option or the best option. Obviously they have AWS and AC panel in a Google Cloud VM as well as an alternative, but Docker Compose, you can run it on any VPS server. It includes a Redis and Postgres setup. So if you do a search on any VPS, there's a numerous amount of VPS providers out there, hosting or let's take, let's take like a few of them. So you can see there's, or I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's Volter, you can see. So if you go with the, the amount of memory in the CPU that I was recommending earlier, you need a minimum of two CPUs and four gigs of RAM for the memory. So it's gonna put you around $20 a month. At a minimum to start with, at the advice is to go with something like this, where it's twenty dollars a month and you can run it a VPS. So that's best for Volter. But obviously, the more CPUs and the more memory you have, the more capable your server is. You can run multiple workloads and tasks simultaneously. Another good option is DigitalOcean, where you can choose droplets. Uh, you can also run it Kubernetes if you're comfortable with any of these. They do have some built-in applications that it's already configured for act running active pieces. So all you have to do is just click and just run it. So it starts with $4 a month. Obviously, you don't want to go with the cheapest option. So there's different options such as the basic droplets where you can start off as cheap as $4 per month or you can go with at least what I was mentioning earlier where you need like at least 4 gigs of RAM and to run CPU. So it's going to cost you about $24 on the basic droplets tier. If you want to move up, it's kind of more expensive, but your server is going to run multiple amount of task simultaneously if you have a long running task that's more involved you want to serve with better cpu and and memory so let's look at the last option it's called hosting hostinger which is also a, a vps hosting provider so 449 per month is cheapest but if you go you can see this it starts with 449 and you can go up based on your requirement this is one of the cheaper option out there and it's a very popular one as well so you get two CPUs for $6.99 per month and you get like two gigs of RAM, which is like reasonable. It's actually really good for this. You don't really need a lot of this, this space. From my experience, most of the resources that you're gonna need is a CPU and, and the RAM. So you're, you're bound by those two resources for your BPS server when running active pieces. The cons for self-hosted is you're gonna have to maintain your own server. You're gonna have to do your own updates. You're gonna have to update to the new version of Active Basis when it gets released. You have to be technically savvy. You need to be comfortable with being able to run uh, Docker, being able to update the images on your server. You have to be comfortable with running your own server and you have to be technically savvy to do that. So that's kind of the only cons that I can see. If you are familiar with Docker or Docker Compose, and you can run it. It's just time consuming, but if you know how to do it, then it's not really a cons per se. So that's gonna be the, the main difference between the two as far as cloud versus a self-hosted hosting for your active pieces. So when you first log into your active account, let's focus on the, the top right. You can see the amount of tasks available for you each month and how much limit you have versus how much tasks you already use so far. You have access to the admin console, which goes back to the projects on the left-hand side. Let's go back to the homepage real quick. If you click on your, your icon on the top right, you're going to see that you can see the different projects. If you have multiple projects, you can change your language, my pieces. I'm, I'm going to cover this in another video, but my pieces allows you to maintain your own pieces, or you can install a pieces that was created by the community. So let's go back to the homepage. So that's going to be the pieces. If you go up and you see the subscription, what's new, and there's a various link going to the community and logging out. All right, so that's going to be the, the top right. Let's focus on the left hand navigation. You see the flows where you can see all the different flows that I have. I can create a folder from, I can go to each one and I can rename a flow. I can move a flow to a different folder if I want to. I can duplicate a flow. So all these things that you can do, you, you can export it and then re-import it into a different installation environment of your active pieces. Or you can share, so you can share your template. 
with others and it's going to get rid of all the credentials that you have associated with that template so it's meant for sharing for your teammates or for public sharing and if you have a git repository or git account you can do a push to git and that's going to require your um, remote git repository your folder name for your git uh, where you want it to to be added and then the branch name the branch name as usually is the, is the master or main whatever the, the branch that you have set for that repository and then the private SSH key. So that's if you want to back up your flow into a Git repository, you have the option. So that's pretty much what you can do with the flow. Let's go and take a look at the runs. So the runs, you're going to be able to toggle multiple pages. If you want, you're going to see all the accounts. You can do your filters by running, failed, succeeded, or paused. But you can filter by specific flows. If you just want to see a specific flow, you can filter from, you can also filter by date. You can do a start and end date so you can see all the different flows that you ran for a specific time frame. You can see that from and you can also toggle if you want to get an email notification if you have a failed run. So you can toggle that or if you just wanna turn it off, that I think that's solely I wanna get a notification of all the failures that I have in my account. So I turned that on and then moving down, you can see the different connections. You can either add the connection manually or you can go to a flow, you can add it there as well. So you can delete it. You can add a new connection, you can see the different pieces they have you can do a search let's say google you can add different ones google docs google drive so all the different pieces you can add the connection up front if and you can see all the various connections that you already have in your account okay moving down you see i only have one project member but you can invite multiple members depending on the type of account or plan that you have and lastly is the git sync and so you can figure currently it's not available for me i think it's based on a type of account that you have i believe the enterprise has this option so if you need to back up your environment and move it to a different one you're gonna have to upgrade all right so let's go take a look at the flow let's go add a new flow and just kind of explain the concept of a trigger and what it is so a trigger is an event in which it starts a workflow it's a condition that when it's met, it initiates the automation process. For example, if you receive a new email in Gmail or a new row being added in Airtable or Google Sheet, that could serve as a trigger. And then the next step would be the action, right? So the action is the event that's automatically performed by active pieces after the trigger has occurred. The action is what active pieces responds to a trigger event. For example, when a new Google Sheet record or row has been created, the trigger would be a new task will be added to a another task a management app, for instance, like Trello or something, or sending an email through a Gmail. That can be an action. So that, that's going to be the, the main flow as far as the trigger and what constitute an action in a, a flow. When you first create a new flow, you can either start from scratch or from a template. So let's explore using template real quick. You can browse the different templates that they have. For instance, you can filter based on analysis, chat GPT. So they have different types of uh, category. The more checkbox, the more specific your filter is going to be. So if, for instance, if you want a template that belongs to analysis and chat GPT, you're going to have to toggle these two. Obviously, if you left out chat GPT, it's going to have more of that but specific ones so if you want the social media one the specific to marketing automation you're gonna have to toggle those ones as well so right off the bat you're gonna be able to see the, the different pieces that's associated with that template so you see the google sheets a uh, code loop and you can use that template and you can uh, learn more about that and you can see a little bit of explanation of what this a template provides for you is very simple so you have a google sheet kicks off and triggers the whole flow it goes through and and get, go to open ai makes a call here and then it does some other stuff as well so you can read more about it and you can use a template so you can do that as well or you can do a search you can do a search based on let's say actually you can do a search on chat gpt and as you can see all the templates that has the option of having a chat gpt as part of that that template flow you can ex explore as well if you want a, a specific app that you're using for instance like if i'm using mailchimp for instance you can, you can do a search i want to go find all the different templates that includes mailchimp piece so that's how you use the template the activity team is always adding new templates so you're gonna have to just watch out for any new templates that gets added so you're just gonna have to wait till more templates get added i personally don't use templates i only go if i want to explore and just for curiosity what the template is doing and if i want to learn about that template 
I can just go and take a look at the different prompts that they're using. I can examine the type of code that they're using and just to kind of examine the flow. So just kind of learn from it. So that's, personally, that's how I use a template. You know, if I want something quick and there's a predefined flow or steps that's already been pre-made, obviously you, you probably want to tweak this and move or change things around. It's just there to expedite and get you close to where you want to be. Another way of creating your flow is from obviously from scratch. So you can just create from scratch. As I've previously mentioned, you have a trigger to initiate and kick off this automation flow. You can select the trigger that's available. You can select from a predefined list. So if it's not listed, that means that application doesn't have a trigger for it yet. So you kind of bound based on the list of the options that you see for now. You can pick between all the different pieces or there's a core piece where you can see the schedule. And there's also some events as well, which is pretty much in, is included in all the triggers. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the different triggers that you can use. If you go and click on the select trigger, you can either switch and change trigger. So this includes everything, including the core. So you include the different application that you're using. It also includes the, the core pieces. You can also use the forms. You can use a webhook. So you can do a schedule based where everything runs based on whatever set of time that you want. So for every X minutes or every hour, every day, every week, or you can do a chronic expression. That's kind of cool as well. So if you just want to build your own, if it's a schedule that's not listed on this list, then you can go ahead and do a chronic expression. Let's say you have a, a weird schedule where you're only doing it on a specific day of the week, or you only want to do it every so from Monday to Friday and you're excluding the weekend, you can do a chronic expression. So there's a lot of flexibility as what type of expression you can define inside your time zone if you want. So in terms of application, you can use something like RSS. So when an RSS feed gets updated, that's what you want to trigger this workflow. That's fine as well. Let's say you're creating an article and, and you want to use that RSS feed as a basis. You want to create a, a social media post for that blog. For instance, if that's your blog, Want to create a social media post for it that you can use that RSS feed to trigger this automation to take off or you can change it to something else. Let's say I want to change it so you can click on this change trigger or you can just click on this select trigger. It's going to pop up this window on the, the right hand side where you can select your trigger. I can set it to Airtable, Airtable or even like Amazon S3. Let's go ahead and explore the webhook uh, trigger. Let's go ahead and change that by clicking on the change trigger on the left hand side. And we can go find the webhook by doing a search you Can go ahead and click on that. So when you click on trigger that makes it active, you can rename a piece by just double clicking on it and just naming it to something else like web trigger. You can be more descriptive on it. And from you only have one option as far as what you can use. So this one is going to be for catching requests. Once you select an option, you're going to be given a URL where you can test it or where you can uh, use another app or flow to trigger this uh, webhook. So you can go ahead and, and copy that link. And you can see from the example, if you want a response from this uh, flow, then you're going to have to append this forward slash link to the URL. So the way I usually test this is I would go to something like Postman where I would just add this or do control N and just create a, a new HTTP request. I can go ahead and, and change this to either get or post. Either way, it's valid. Most of the time I'm using posts. If I'm passing in a large set of parameters as part of the body, then I'm going to go ahead and use this one. You can either use a form data or you can use a raw if you want to pass in a JSON. Either way, it's going to be the same as far as the webhook is concerned. So let's go ahead and do a test one there. So if you want to test this out, we're just going to go ahead and click this test trigger in the bottom and you can go back to Postman. You copy that URL. Let's say I want to do a post request on this one. So I'm going to have to pass everything through the body. I'm going to pass everything as JSON. So I can either do a, a JSON. I can just suit. Hey, I want to pass in the name as part of the body and it's going to be my name and then I'm going to send this over and that's going to be passed in as part of the body of the webhook. So it's going to be the same thing when you do a, let's say I want to switch to form data type of request. Let's say I want to do the same thing. It's, it's a key value pair form data. I can just pass in the Dennis key is the name and then the value is Dennis. So I can go ahead and 
do a retest, click on retest, and then I can go ahead and do a resend that. So I'm sending it the same way. The webhook is going to be receiving that body. Either I do a form data or a raw JSON. It's going to be accepted. So from I pre what I previously mentioned, if you want to return something from this webhook, you're going to have to append forward slash sync as part of this webhook. So if I go back to Postman, if I do a forward slash sync, I can have the webhook return something. I have to add an HTTP piece right to actually send back a response to whoever is calling this webhook. So there's a return response as part of this HTTP piece where actually I can return a response to that request. So let's say I want to respond with hello, hello. And then I'm going to be responding with whatever was passed in from the body. So let's say I want to pass in the name. So I'm going to be returning a payload that has the hello. The property is going to be hello. And then it's going to have the name. I can even concatenate it if I want to like hello, hello Dennis or whatever the name is that comes in. So I can go ahead and do that, but I will have to do a publish on this one first. If I create a request in Postman and I send a request to this one with a forward slash sync. So whatever I send, for instance, I'm sending in the name and Dennis, if I do a send request, I'm expecting this, the webhook to return back a JSON with the hello and then hello and whatever the name is I'm passing in. So if I pass in Rob or Bob or whatever, then it's going to be dynamically set to whatever I'm sending to that webhook because that's how I define that webhook. All right. So that's going to be for the webhook. Let's take a look at the forms so I can go ahead and do that by switching to, to a different trigger. So I'm going to go ahead and type the, the form forms. So it's going to be forms beta so it's going to be a trigger it's going to do a form on form submission or a simple form submission let's go ahead and take a look at the on form submission as you can see the same thing with webhook you're given a url where you can access from anywhere in the internet so go ahead and copy this link so obviously you want to have to you want to create an input let's say i want to do an input let's say you can set a, a field type either a text text area file if you wanted to have uh, the client attach a file so let's just kind of keep it simple i'm just going to put name and just put name so that's going to be the name of this field it's going to be the, it's called the name and i have it a label of name and with the field time of text and i need to publish this again i can just gotta go ahead and copy that link and and that brings me obviously i can rename my form to something else let's say i want to name this to some form tests you know to publish that and that's going to reflect the name of that form so you're going to see here that's the name of the, the flow and i've named it name with a label of name so I, I can go ahead and click on submit and that's going to be submitting that form into that flow so if you want the form to respond let's say I've, i i do a submit this form and i, I want this flow to respond to it i need to add a, another step which will do a response so i need to pick forms again and i'm gonna have to pick forms and i can either respond with a file or respond with a markdown let's say i want to do a return a markdown i'm going to do a simple hello and then i'm going to be let's go ahead and, and do a test and go ahead and do a retest and then i'm going to go ahead and submit this and that should give me the body of a name dennis and i can go ahead and use that let's, let's go ahead and use that so i typed in Hello, and then I'm going to concatenate my name that's been submitted. I'm going to go ahead and submit that. So this is going to be returned to the client, whoever submitted to that form. You're going to be being able to see that. So let's go ahead and test this one by publishing. Once you publish and submit to this form, and you're going to see that you're going to be seeing the, the markdown of that response. So that's how easy it is to, to create a form and either get a response or no response, just depending on what you're trying to do. So you're going to have to toggle this request, wait for response. If you are returning something, but you have to make sure you also select a form with a specific action to respond with either markdown or with a file. So that's that for triggers as far as the webhook and then the forms. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is how to manage a flow. So from when you first land in a flow, let's say you have a huge flow like this, you want to be able to navigate to the bottom. So instead of having to use your left mouse click to scroll down to the bottom, you can just go ahead and fit the screen so the 
the bottom left you can see the fit the screen you can just go ahead and click on that and that will allow you to see the whole flow from top to bottom so if you want to go just all the way to the bottom you can just go ahead and do the fit the screen and then you can zoom in from and, you, and allows you to just kind of get there much quicker so same so you want to reset and go back to the top let's go ahead and scroll to the top and that's since i'm ready or you can also let's say you're zoomed out all the way and just want to go back to the default zoom or you're all the way down here just go ahead and please click on the reset zoom this will allow you to go back to where you came from initially when you first looked at in into the zoom if you want to just go navigate to from top to bottom you can go ahead zoom in or zoom out and then you know if you just want to pan down do a left click on the mouse or you can fit the screen and you just if you just want to go straight to the bottom you can just go ahead and still hard but you know it's it gets you much quicker so you're i'm already there at the bottom so and then do it to reset all right so let's go ahead and reset this to the current zoom so if you make any changes to your flow let's say i want to make changes to this one i added some characters or add space so you can see that's automatically saving it for you by default so you don't have to do any there's no other button to click to save this flow and you can see that the publish button it becomes active that means that there's a version at the moment that's been saved that's currently not published so you need to make sure that you always click on publish and that ensures that you're creating a version of your flow so it creates multiple versions which allows you to later on to go back and view or review any of the previous versions by clicking on this icon and you can go and click on the view and this will put you on a read only view where you can only view but not really edit because you're accessing a view from the previous iteration you can go ahead and edit this flow which push you back in the most recent draft so if you go it's going to put you back all the way up to the top so the eye is, is showing that you're currently looking at the most recent version of this flow so if you go back to this version let's say i want to view this so it's going to go ahead and go back to that version and then you can see the view or the eye is set to this particular version and if i want to go back to a, a previous version i can go ahead and use this as draft and this will allow you to restore to a previous uh, draft just be careful with this because it's this is going to overwrite the most recent version that's been saved on file so you just have to be be careful but this this also can be handy if you just want to restore your flow to a previous version let's say you made a mistake and you think that the version that you had previously was better and you had a better run so you can go ahead and do that and do a use as a draft and do a publish on that as well so if you want to go back to the current one just go ahead and edit flow and that will put you in the current most recent version and then from you can go ahead and test the flow aside from being able to test it individually you can go click on individual piece and go ahead and retest it but if you want to test the whole flow as a whole then you have to click on this test flow and this will go and test the entire flow in entirety from top to bottom that's it and make sure you always click publish whenever you make the changes so you don't lose on any unsaved changes so next thing i want to talk to you guys about is the different pieces that allows you to do conditional or control the flow the first thing i want to talk to you guys about is the loop piece right so i'm going to give an example how to use it let's bring in a code that gives us an array i want to write a code and this allows us to let's go ahead and bring this up and make this bigger you can kind of see it's going to return an array so an array is inside the square brackets so let's do a one two and three and then four that allows us to return back in a series of integers one two three four and as you can see, and then now you can use this to loop and iterate to those items so i can go ahead and bring in the loop on items and we can bring in the code which includes the different numbers that we have set for that array if you do a test you're given an, a list of numbers in an array and then we can go ahead and feed it into this loop by clicking on it instead of clicking on the individual ones you can see you can just insert the entire result by just clicking on it this allows you to to step on it and you can see the index which is one and then the item is the number one as first iteration of that loop and then the next time it 
do an iteration, it's going to be number two. And the next thing is going to be item two. So aside from the number, obviously you can also return, you can also return an object. For instance, you're working with objects, for instance, you can go ahead and let's say have multiple objects that has name, let's say Dennis, and then I have another one. Let's say I have another object that has a name of Bob. So that gives me two objects with a name property inside of it. So I can go ahead and execute that. So now you see that you have an iterated object. You can go ahead and iterate that to that as well. And the next time you run this, you're going to be given an index as well as the items itself. So for each item, you're going to see there's a name of a dentist and you pretty much do whatever you want with it. You can use another piece and you can feed that item inside of that piece, right? That's how a loop works. The next thing I want to bring in is the use of the branch. Let's say I want to do some logic and I want to do a test where I can say if a specific value meets the condition based on the second value, if it's true, then it's going to go to this left side of the branch. And if it's false, it's going to go. So in, that's for instance, I'm iterating to put this items in this array and I want to conditionally check if the name is Dennis. So I can go ahead and do that by feeding it into this on the first value, I can set it to the name of Dennis and the condition is either a text contains or te text starts with something. There's other conditions that you can use if you're doing a condition based on a number greater than specific some numbers or based on a Boolean. So let's say you're coming, you have a value that you want to test and you want to make sure that it's true, then you can set this to true. For the exist one, you can check it if a certain property exists within an array or an object. You can do a check if that exists. I use it a lot if I'm checking if an item in an array exists or not. And then I can go and do some additional logic as part of that condition and it does not exist. So there's uh, the opposite of that exists. So there's a lot of things that you can kind of work with as far as what type of the data you're working against with and so let's say i want to check let's say my stuff starts with or exactly matches dennis i can go and test that and from you can see the condition is true obviously if i change this to something else does not contain dennis this will be a false because it's going to go and and you can do whatever else that you need to do on the on the right hand side of this branch. So that's how it is for the the branch is concerned. Let's go ahead and take a look at the the delay. So the delay is something that you would use if you want to slow down the process. Let's say you're dealing with some external API and just want to make sure that your flow gives us enough time to process. For instance, you're processing an AI image and that AI image can take a very long time to finish. Sometimes you want to do a buffer and a little bit of delay on it. So you can do a delay for, for a few seconds or minutes or hours or days. You can do that as well. Just depending on requirement, you can set it for whatever you want. And then from the, for the delay until you can set this for a specific time to so delay it for a specific date so you can send it dynamically based on the previous step or you can just hand code it so let's say i want to i want to delay this until 4 15 24 i can do that as well and that will delay it until that time another piece i want to take a look at is the text helper so let, let's go ahead and, and take a look at that so do a search on text helper it allows you to do some processing for your text so there's some utilities that you can use without having to use the, the code piece of this automation so for instance if you want to do some concatenation between two strings or some integer values then you can do that you can add multiple text for instance on the concatenate on one and two and i want to do a comma separated between them i can go ahead and do that and it's going to give me the one and two concatenated separated by comma i can go ahead and get rid of that comma as well if you want to do that there's going to be no separator between them i can do hello and then the second one would be world and then i can go ahead and do that and do a separation i can even do it as a space in between to add a separation between that for replacement let's say i want to do hello and then i want to replace the l and i want to replace it with 
help i can go ahead and do that and this is going to replace the llo with so that's how you do the text helper there's other stuff as well if you want to convert markdown to html let's say i want to convert strong text to html and that's going to allow me to convert this markdown text to html variant i can choose the markdown for the version of github or by default i haven't really figured out which which one is which but you can go ahead and try it like that and it's going to give you this html according to that syntax let's go ahead and go back to the default let's go ahead and see how that looks it's the same thing original it's also the same thing so it surrounds it with a p tag and a strong tag surrounding that text it's the same thing and yeah you can do some other stuff as well and do the other way around so let's say i want to do a p tag or let's do a h2 and hello and that would convert that into the markdown equivalent that's going to be the text helper the next thing i want to explore is the crypto let's say you want to do some cryptography and hashing of the password it can go and create from text to hash so using the algorithm of md5 shot two fifty or shot 512 you can go and do that and then you can pass in the text that you want and then you know you can choose the the highest one shot 512 and it will give you the hash for that text same thing if you want to generate some password or randomize it so let's say you're automating a system where it generates a password for you automatically so this one is ready for you so you can do an alphanumeric or alphanumeric plus symbol so you can just set those ones and it will randomly just create a password for you that's hard to guess so if you need something that that's gonna help you do that then you can choose crypto the next thing I want to take a look at is read connection. So this is something that you're probably not going to use that much, but it helps if you want to read the connection string or the key that you have set for whatever platform you're using. For instance, for OpenAI, let's say I want to be able to read the key for my OpenAI. So I can go to my connections, just find the name that you need. For instance, I open the eye, I can go and copy this name, right? Let's say I want to see how I'm connected to Google Drive. I can copy that and for stability, I can reverse engineer and find out what the the key that I've is stored in the system. I can just copy this, the name of this connection and I can go and paste the key that I want. And this is going to give me the raw key that I've set for that connection so it's something you're probably not going to need as much but it's good to have if you forgot the key and just want to read it back so you can use it for whatever reason then you can use this read connection next thing i want to take a look at the storage let's say i want to be able to store some data from within the flow i can go and do that by using the storage so let's take a look at the individual one so do you have a get put append remove add to list and remove from list so the easiest one is to get where you can just pass in the key let's say i want to pass in the key of test the scope is where you want this key to be visible at on is and whether it's on a project level where you can see it from across the different flows or if you just want to be able to retrieve the data from the storage only on the flow level right if you just want to see it from or if you want to just see it from within each individual run which is handy if you just want to keep things isolated you don't want the data to bleed between the different flows you can do that as well to keep it separated so you would choose the the run and from you can do a default value for instance if you don't set anything let's say i haven't set anything in this key i want to return x because that's the default value for it. So it's going to give me an X since I haven't really put anything on this storage as far as this key. So let's say I want to do a put on this test and then I want to put X, Y and I want to isolate it on the flow, for instance. So I want to go ahead and do a test on this. So that puts X, Y. So I want, I need to set this to flow if I want to be able to see it since I, I set the put to flow. So if I want to see the X, Y, I can go ahead and and retest and you can see I'm getting the X, Y as opposed to X since I've put something in the storage and it's the X has been overridden by the new value. 
Next thing I want to explore is the append. So let's say you're working with comma separated values. So this is something that you can use. For instance, I want to do a separator of a comma and let's do a test one as a key. And from let's say I want to do a comma separated values. Let's say I'm in a loop and for each iteration of this loop, I want to add in a value and I want to append it as part of this key. So this is going to accumulate all these values over time and it's going to string them together by the separator. So if I add one and I hit retest, next time I pull this value, it's going to be one, right? So the next time, let's say I want to, next iteration, I want to do a retest and that should add two as part of this list. And next time I retrieve it, it's going to be two, but you kind of get the point, right? So that appends these additional values inside of this key because I'm using this append and it's separated by this comma. So it's going to be three. And when I do a test, it's going to be three. So that's that for the append. As far as removing it, removing it's very, fairly easy. Let's say I just want to remove everything on that particular key. Let's go ahead and just retest that. And the success is true. And next time I do a test, it should give me back an X because I cleared it and it goes back to the default value. So it's, the remove is pretty easy and it's pretty straightforward. Add to list is pretty much when you're working with an array. So let's say I want to do an array of, it's called test one. I want to do add one. I want to keep it at the flow level. Let's say I want to add it to that list. That should put this on an array instead of a string. So that's the difference between adding to list versus appending it to a list. So I append, it adds it to an array. And the next time around, let's say I want to add in addition to the one, I want to do a retest again. Next next time you're going to see the one and the two. So when you do a retrieval and do a get and a flow, you can see that the array contains one and two. So if I want to remove the one from this list, I just want to specify the key and the value that I want to remove. So I name the key test one and the value that I want to remove is number one. So I'm going to go ahead and execute that. And that should keep only keep two in that list. And next time I retrieve that, it's going to be just two in that list. So if I want to remove the last one, which is two, I can go ahead and execute that. Now the array is empty. And next time I go back and look at this one, it's going to be nothing since I'm working with a list. So this value right, doesn't apply anymore. So that's how it is in terms of working with storage. The next piece I want to talk about is one of the more important piece of active presets. It's the HTTP. When you have to interact with a third party platform and active pieces doesn't have a piece for it yet. This allows you to overcome that by being able to communicate to that platform or provider via this HTTP piece. Most of the time you're going to be using the send HTTP, which allows you to send a request to that API URL. The other option is the return response, which is only being used if you are using the webhook and you want to return a payload as part of that webhook request. So you only use the return request if you're using the webhook along with a response that goes along with it. So, but if you're communicating with a, an external API, you're going to be using this send HTTP request, which allows you to select a method. So you have to look at their documentation and see what type of method they require you to, to use as part of that request. So most of the time you're going to be using a get or a post. So get is usually when you're trying to retrieve some data. When you are trying to manipulate some data, you usually use a post versus a get. So most of the time you're going to be using the, those two type of methods for HTTP. Obviously this URL, so you're going to have to specify the URL for that API that you're using. And then for the headers, most of the time you're going to be using this for Let's say for authorization, where you can type in the authorization and then you can do a bearer token where you can just pass in the token as part of that headers request. So if you're familiar with working with Postman, you have to use that to play around with it. And usually you're passing in the headers. Query parameters is usually associated when you're making a request via GET on HTTP. So this allows you to add extra query parameters as part of the URL. So you can do a key value pair. So key, key one, and that's going to do a question mark. Key one equals to some value. 
and then key two and so on and so forth so like i said most of the time this is associated with the get but if you're dealing with the post usually you're going to be dealing with the body type so you're going to be changing the body type to either to one of these so the json and raw is pretty much synonymous to each other depending on just how you want to just look at the data so json has this like prettier json body you can kind of see it and you can make it prettier as opposed to raw which is kind of the same thing the raw body you know either way you're going to be passing in a json body in the form of proper json body such as the key value pair let's say test of tennis that's going to be key of test and then it's going to be the the data of tennis that's going to be part of this json so either one of these works and it kind of ruins it if you switch to form data which i didn't want the form data is more of just a key value pair and it, it constitutes just different way of of passing in the data and it usually creates a form data object where you can pass in depending on what the api requires some of them requires a form data and some of them usually when you're passing in you're touching a file as part of the payload you're going to be using in the form data but most of the time json would just suffice that request just by passing in json so that's how you work with it just make sure that you look at the the documentation for the api that you're working with and making sure that you have the correct method and you have the correct url endpoint and the authorization if you have a api key that you need to pass in you need to set it sometimes the api key is going to be put in the query parameters for instance i know that google data api re requires you to pass in the api key as part of the the query parameters so in that case, you're gonna have to pass it. So for the next piece I wanna to talk to you guys about is the image helper. So I did pre prepare an example. So I have an image that I've created via Stability AI. I did unplug in a Stable Diffusion XL, and then I did configure scale of seven, and I did two samples. So it provided me with two images based on the two samples that have specified uh, 10 steps. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at the image helper. I can go ahead and specify image helper. So this allows me to work with images. If I want to convert an image to base 64, I can go ahead and just click on the image and I, it allows me to go and read and specify the image that I want to convert to base 64. If you want to overwrite the MIME type, if let's say you want to convert it to a different type of MIME type, you can specify, I think by default, the MIME type coming back from Stability AI is going to be image for slash png so if you want to go convert it to this jpeg then you have to pass it for instance image slash jpeg or png so if you want to override that i think that's something you can add so let's go ahead and do a if for instance the api that you're using doesn't provide the mime type so you're going to go and get something like this where it's data goes to false so sometimes it's just better to just provide the image mime type and do an execute on it because sometimes APIs such as Stability AI doesn't provide that mind type for you. So if you examine the image that's coming back from their API, you can examine what that mind type is going to be. So you can just specify since their API is not really providing that information, it's just safe to just provide and add that mind type. So you can for sure get the correct date for that particular image. So that's, a, that's that. If you want to convert an image to B64, this is a useful tool. This is good for if you're publishing to WordPress. I did a video on publishing to WordPress, so you can go ahead and take a look at that. If you want to publish to WordPress, usually it accepts some form of the base 64. So all you have to do is just insert the result of this, which is the base 64, and that will publish that image to WordPress. So you can use the image to basic support for this one. Let's go ahead and look at the other options that you have when using the image helper. The other option that you have is you can get the image metadata. So I can pass in the image that I have. So let's say I want to pass in the image and let's go ahead and click on the test step. And you can see, take a look at things such as the DBA64, the description, um, the the width of the image and the height. There's some other better data that you can take a look at and the file type as well. So you can kind of gives you some more details as far as what the image is. So you can use this image helper for that. If you want to crop an image to a certain width and height, you can specify here the left, the top, the width and the height. So starting from the position in the top. So 
how far it is from the top. You can do some calculation on that, how far from the top and how far from the left you want to crop to start the crop and then how big of the width and the height. So wanna limit the crop to a certain width and height, you can pass that in. So that's that for cropping. If you want to rotate an image and how many degrees, so 90, 180, 270. And then as, as always passing in the image, you can do rotation of image, you can do a resize of an image as well. That's one of the options. If you want to do compress an image, so for instance, if you want to save on storage and you just want to reduce the quality, you can reduce the quality to a high quality or lossy quality. So those are the two options that you have. As far as the format, you can change it to either JPEG or PNG. So those are the two things that you can change it to. So that's that for the image helper. Let's take a look at the, the date helper, which is another helpful piece that's available in active pieces. So when you create a date helper, you're going to be presented with the different actions that you can take. So for instance, you can get the current date and you can specify the time format. So you can specify, let's say, I just want to choose this format. I can go ahead and also specify the time zone that I can set for the date. So that's, I want to keep it at UTC by default. And you can see that it gives me March 16, 2024, which is the current date. You can also select other formats such as the month, month, slash DD, slash YY, which just give me this format. It's going to give me two digits for the month, two digits for the day, and then the year, which is four digits for that. So let's go ahead and take a look at the format dates. So whatever you choose from our date has to match whatever it's, it's if I choose this format. So I want to go switch to this format. I can go ahead and and pick, let's say I'm going to do 03-14. And this is going to be allowing me to change to a, a different format. So from this format into this time format, I need to be able to pass in the date in the specific format. I need to make sure that it comes with the four digits month for characters for the, the date and then the four characters for the year to match this one. And then I want to be able to convert to this type of format. So let's say I want to convert it to the starts with the year type of format. So let's go ahead and do a test on that one. And that will convert this type of date format into whatever representation of the format they specify. So I can go ahead and, and switch it to another one. Let's say I want to switch it to this X format. And this is just going to convert it to this type of format. So whatever is required for the thing you're interacting with, such as the platform and it requires a specific format, then you can use this format date for that. Let's say I want to extract the date units. I can go ahead and do that as well. So you I need to pass it in a specific format. Let's say I want to pass in the date in this format. So let's go ahead and pass in the date. So do three and then 16 and then 2024. Okay. So I want to just be able to extract the year from this date. So when I do a red test on this one, you just have to make sure that you're following this format from time format and you'll be able to extract a specific unit from that date. So let's say I'm extracting the year and also I want to extract the month, the day and the hour. I can go ahead and do that. So I can just remove, let's say I want to leave off the day. I can go ahead and click on that. And this is going to give me this object, which contains the year, month and day separately as a separate property. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other ones. So the difference, so let's say, from 0, 3, 14, 24. Actually, I need to copy this format. So let's, let's pick a format that matches this specific format. Let's pick this one since it matches the one that I entered. And I want to be able to, let's say, select 0, 3, 24, 2025. 20, so let's say, let's give it a year from now. Oh, so I want to be able to get the difference. So I need to pass in and match this format. So I need to pick a date format that matches the, the ending date that I've specified above. So this has to match. So when I do a retest, it should give me one year. So that's a unit. So if I want to get the months, I need to switch that to a month and that should give me the amount of months. And if I want to calculate based on the date, I want to, I want to see how many days between those two different days. It tells me this is 375 days. So you can select the month in a year and maybe the hours and it will give you the object that contains 
the three different properties according to what you've selected as the units and giving me the year, the month, day, and the hour. This is a very useful helper if you want to determine the difference between two dates. You just have to make sure that what you're specifying should match whatever the date format that's been selected. So you just have to be careful. Otherwise, it's going to give you an error. So the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is how to use the code in active pieces. Let's go ahead and add a code piece. And I want to demonstrate a few things on how to use it. So let's go ahead and add it by doing a search. So the way it works is you can add an input which is a key value pair you can add as many key value pairs as you want and you can specify the name and the value let's go ahead and remove this let's say i want to provide my name and the inputs so the inputs can come from the previous step from this flow but in this case i'm just hard coding from my name but you can easily include any inputs either coming from the webhook or any from the previous step Let's go ahead and for simplicity, I just want to include my name in Dennis. So if you scroll down to the bottom, you can go ahead and test step. By default, you're going to get this export cons equals cons code equals to async. And then you're going to have this curly braces. And then anything that you return, is going to be returned for this code. And anything that's been returned, we can use it in the, the next step in the flow. So if you can do it and execute, since I'm returning a true, hard coded as true, it's returning a, a boolean of true. So if, it, if I change this to false, it's going to be returning a false. So that's what I've specified. So for me, you can also return an object, not just a string. If, you, if you're not familiar with code, it's essentially a key value pair inside an object. So which is an object is looks like this, right? So curly braces, and then you have some property inside, such as test equals to Dennis. So that's what a, an object looks like. In JavaScript. All right, so let's go ahead and and take a look at some other examples. For instance, let's say I want to return the name and De Dennis as part of this return. So let's go ahead and so I can access the name from the inputs. So I can go ahead and put in inputs.name and that should return the name because that's how we specified in, in the name. So you have to be careful if you, you specify name and you put something like inputs.name1, then obviously that's not going to work as Name one hasn't been defined, so it's going to give you an undefined. So you have to be, be careful that it matches the, the key that you provided above in the inputs. If I just want to return everything that I have set for the inputs parameter, I, was, I can just go ahead and just return the entire inputs. And that's going to return an object that includes the name and my name. So let's go ahead and do a retest on that one. And that includes an object that has like a name of Dennis. And if I do a color with the name, let's say it's to blue and that includes the name and the color blue. So you can see everything that I've, I've said above in the name and the color, it's being set in this inputs and that object contains whatever I want. Usually I would do a destructure. So for instance, I'm doing the name and go ahead and, and name in the color and I want to use it inside my code. Let's go ahead and destructure it. I'm defining a couple of constants which include the name and the colors and I'm, I'm extracting it from this inputs. And this allows me to be able to work with this two parameters in this code. So let's go ahead and return a string. Let's do a backtick so I can do it. So I'm doing hello and then I'm doing this dollar sign and then curly braces and then the name. After I've, I've set my string, I can go ahead and retest and that should just return hello and then my name since i did a, a back tick for the string and it allows me to be able to set a dynamic a variable calling the name and then returning that and then i can expand on that my favorite color is and then i'm doing dollar sign a color braces and then color i can essentially use that color and also you can right click on this code editor and i can do a format document which cleans up and make it nice and pretty so I can go ahead and do a retest. You can see that I'm specifying my name and then my favorite color is blue, All right? So if I change this to something else like green and it's gonna change it to green. So let's go ahead and jump into a more complex example. So I've written, I have Cloudy AI as a code example. So I've specified another code that accepts a title and the Cloudy AI key, which I'm providing from the previous step, from step number two. And then I went ahead and added a code that I'm using from the same code I'm using from my previous code regarding Cloud AI and accessing their API. So if you need a refresher, 
So essentially, if the way to access it is from console.atrophic website, I'm using the Claude 3 Haiku, which is like the latest model that I have. My prompt is to have it return a valid JSON that will contain an array of five headlines, blog titled for this blog title, and the JSON will include a description and the five headlines. So I'm providing an example. I want it to give me a summary and then a string of headlines. And then it's going to be contained within this JSON string. So that's all I'm asking for. I can go ahead and get the code from this and by switching to TypeScript. So essentially that this is why I'm running. So, and when you execute this code, let's go ahead and take a look at the response that we get. When we execute this code, we're essentially just returning this text, which includes this JSON, which just a bunch, a bunch of other characters as well. So we're going to parse this out and turn this into a JavaScript object that we can use in our flow. So let's go ahead and go switch back to this code. We can, we can delete this or we can add a new one. So let's go ahead and delete this one since we don't really need it. Let's go ahead and add another code and let's pass in JSON as a input parameter. And then let's go ahead and pull the value from, from step three, which is from the um, Claudia response. Let's go ahead and drill to that one. So we're going to go ahead and to the content, the first press response content response, and then just go and select the text. You can see on the, the right hand side, it's giving you the text that's being inserted. So let's do that. So by default, I have this code as well. Let's go ahead and just return the inputs, inputs.json. So that's where the JSON is being set. So let's return it. So in our case, it's returning an actual JavaScript object which is fine. We can work with this and use it in any subsequent steps that we want. But let's say I want to work with this response and I just want to be able to just grab the headlines and let's see. Let's say I just want to extract the headlines and return an array of string that only contains the headlines from the risk and get rid of everything else. Let's go ahead and use the ask AI to generate a code for us that will just return the array of string and nothing else. So let's go ahead and try it out. So we can ask AI by clicking on this ask AI and we can pass in the existing code that we have. And let's go ahead and say, write a code that will return a JavaScript array of string. The inputs has a JSON string with two properties, headlines and description. I want you to return just the headlines, but just the array and nothing else. Let's go ahead and ask AI if see if it can give us a code based on our prompt. All right, so let's see. So it provided the inputs and parsed it out that JSON. It includes the headlines and returning. Actually, it looks pretty good. So let's go ahead and use this code. So we can go ahead and we can either request an adjustment and do an, an ask or we can use this code. So this is going to replace the code that we have. It replaced the code with the new code that AI provided for us. Let's go ahead and retest this. And that's it. Yeah, so you, you get an array of just strings with just the headlines and nothing else. So the, the Ask AI was able to interpret and work with the prompt that we have, and it was able to just return the string. So in order to use the Ask AI, you have to be specific on the intent of what you want to get out of it. So in order for it to work properly with whatever you're doing. So that's how that's how it is when working with code in Actipieces. The last thing I want to talk to you guys is the additional option that you can use in Actipieces development. So when you're working with the flow, so I've added here an example for a piece in a table. So there's an option where you can do a control in failure. So for instance, if you are creating a record, there's various pieces that has this option where, where it allows you to continue on a failure. For instance, if you're interacting with a platform that might cause an issue in the future, you can go ahead and toggle this feature, which allows you to continue that flow and not break your automation because of a failure. So this is an option that you can use when interacting with the API. Sometimes it's glitchy and sometimes it doesn't work too well. And sometimes you just want to keep going, but you have to do some validation, making sure that the data 
is correct in order to, if you want to toggle this feature but it's a good feature to have if you are encountering a lot of issues with a certain api and you don't want the, the flow in our automation to fail just because of one failure in a step another option that you can also use is to auto retry on failure so it says right automatic retry up to four attempts when failed so if you have a, a an API that you're interacting with, it's super glitchy and sometimes it, it times out or whatever, this is also a good option as well. Obviously, you want to do some additional checking as well. You can do a branch where you can set to check. For instance, if, if I'm creating a record, I can specify that since this one's returning an ID, if it fails, that means that this create record didn't succeed. So I can do additional validation so that I can check if the ID was returned when I did a create a record. So that's one thing that you can do in response to an error, just in case you encounter it, if you set those two things. So if I do a retry or do a continue and failure, you, you need to make sure that you have a way to control the flow and do some validation and have some validation in place so that if in case of a failure, you can do a check if the ID exists or a property exists, depending on what platform you're using so that you can keep moving and not have a failure stop your automation from running. So those are the two things that you can do. Aside from that, this wraps it up for this video. I don't want to make it too long, but if you have any specific topics that you'd like me to do a video on, please go ahead and write down in the comments. I do read every single one of them and right up on the top is another video that you might be interested in. So please go ahead and check it out. Please go ahead and like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys on the next video.